Let's just have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just, just come before you and thank you for who you are. Father, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy and just declare that you are God and our King and our Lord and our Savior. Father, we just thank you for the shed blood that, that has redeemed us from every curse of the law that allows us to come boldly to your throne of grace, knowing that when we pray, you hear, and when you hear, you answer. Father, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost that leads us and guides us in all truth, that gives us wisdom and revelation and shines a light on our path. Father, thank you for the food that we are receiving. Let it be strength and nourishment for our bodies. You said you would bless our food and our water and take sickness from the midst of us. And Father, I just declare that over this meeting that, that your presence is here. I declare that angels are active. Father, I declare that your, your spirit would have free course in, in the hearts and minds of your people, that no flesh would glory in your sight. In the name of Jesus, amen. I want you guys to, uh, over the last several weeks, uh, it's been really on my heart to, uh, to just kind of uh, share some things with the, with the partners online. Uh, whenever I get prayer requests, whenever I send out prayer requests, I always get 100, 200 prayer requests. Uh, Brother Mike was fortunate to see some of them. There was just a few. I told him, I said, I got a bunch more. But one, there, there's a common thread that runs through all of them, and that is finances. Finances run through I'd say 100% of them. And so over the last several months, you know, I, I'm not this type of person that I, I really like to ask people to sow into the ministry. And years ago, my mom, when she was alive, she told me, she said, uh, you know, she would always sow into me or when we were at the church, she would always try to give me extra money and and I, and I would say, Mom, you know, Mom, keep your money. I don't need it. You know, we're doing fine. Ministry's fine. The church is fine. And she told me, she said, why are you trying to stop me from receiving a blessing by sowing into your life? And so that, that kind of changed my thought process that here I have, by me not asking people to, to, to give or teaching people to give, I actually hinder people from being blessed in some regards. God is still going to bless his people. Amen. But I, I believe that in the blessing of God, it's like a pie. If you do certain things, there's a slice that will you can pull out and you'll be blessed. You know, tithing is one of them. Sowing seed is another. Being obedient and studying God's word is another slice of the pie. There's several slices in a pie that, if, that most people only, only take out one or two slices. And so over the last several months with the prayer request, it's really been a burden on my heart to see God's people blessed financially. And so I, I started this, I started... Uh, I think Brother Ken probably there's a few people that respond uh, but I began to teach about seed sowing and a, a couple of weeks ago I taught uh, the process that a seed goes through in order for it to grow mm -hmm. it needs light it needs water it needs uh, uh, nutrients and it needs, and it needs time which is key. It needs a lot of time. You know, the scripture says, first the blade, then the ear, and then the full, the full corn. The fruit. You know, so as I begin to teach, one of, my, one of my partners, he said, Pastor Riley, he said, let me write a, he said, if you don't mind, let me write the next uh, partner letter. He said, because I've seen every time I sow into the ministry, I receive a miracle. I receive a financial miracle. Not sometime, but every time. And so 
I let him write the last partner letter, December partner letter, and it was actually pretty good, but I had to soften it, you know, <laughs> because he's just direct to the point. If you don't sow, you don't, if you don't sow, you don't reap, you know, I mean, but anyway, so over the last couple of weeks, I've been dealing with watering your seed, uh, using the word of God, declaring the word of God over your seed. And so this week, I, I just kind of felt like I wanted to share this with, with you. Uh, and this is water for, for, water for your seed, day one. And this is the decree uh, that, that, that God gave me for you, for the people. The scripture is uh, 2 Peter 1 and 3. It says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. A guy sent me an email Saturday and said, Pastor Riley, why do so many people struggle with receiving uh, the message of seed time and harvest? And I told him, I said, it's because they really don't understand. They really don't understand God's plan from the very beginning. And I told him, I said, from the very beginning, God ordained that everything in this earth was created for his people. So if it was created for his people, then there's abundance created for God's people. And you can look at the a third of Jesus' teachings that he taught were on seed time and harvest. It was about money. Out of the 49 parables he taught, 39 parables, a third of them was about money. There's over 2,000 scriptures uh, in, the old in, the, in the word of God dealing with money. And I used to hear Dr. Tom, Dr. Tom would always say, uh, he told a guy one time, if, if you don't believe that God wants to prosper you, give me all your money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. That's what he would always, that's what he said. And so I know a lot of people struggle with, well, should we be blessed? But how can you give how can you give if you don't receive? How can you, as the scripture says, give to every good work if you don't receive? How can we as Christians change the culture of this nation? Yeah, we, we pray and we seek God, but it takes resources. How can we effectively minister to the widows and orphans if we don't have the resources? Amen? And this whole year, I've been, my whole thought process is to get you into a mindset of receiving God's best for your life. Some have, are walking in it, some are not. But this is the, the, this is the decree that, uh, that I've decreed over the people, that I wanted the people to decree over themselves. Beloved, let's declare the word of God over your seed today. I declare that through the blood of Jesus I have been, de been redeemed from the curse of the law. Because I'm redeemed, God's divine power has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. I decree that favor operates in every area of my life and whatever I put my hands to prospers. I decree, that fi I decree the financial seeds that I've sown multiply and my health is renewed. I decree that I walk in the knowledge of what Christ purchased through, purchased for me through the shedding of his blood in Jesus' name. That's the decree that, that I decree over you, that you would walk in the knowledge of what Christ has provided for you through his blood. I'm a firm believer in 2018. God is already dealing with my heart. As I said it before, and we see a separation, we see that in politics, there's a divide going on. I believe God has orchestrated that divide. I also believe that in 2018, 
you're going to you're going to begin to see those that proclaim that, that that are Christians and those that proclaim that they are but are not really. I believe that divide is coming. I, I do. Sometimes God will will because we don't really understand what God is doing and we really don't seek to know what God is doing. Sometimes God will allow the natural to, to reflect what's going on in the spiritual. Amen? Now, some of you do know what's going on, but some don't know what's going on. The Bible says that the sons of Issachar knew the times and seasons. And as we all believe that Christ is coming, we don't know when. It might be a thousand years. It might be tomorrow. But what I want you to understand, I wanna, I wanna, what I want to encourage you is that make sure that you seek the Lord for his purpose and his plan. Because in this separation, God is not obligated to fulfill your plans. He's only obligated to fulfill his plans. Amen? And I, I just want you to, I want to encourage you to be mindful of where you are. To be mindful of, of who's in your life. Uh, be mindful of where you go. Be mindful. Because deception is rampant in the land. It's, just, it's, it's rampant. Just be mindful. Paul said to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered. Contend for it. God has great things planned for your life. But you have to contend for them. You have to fight for them. You have to allow the Spirit of God to, to, to guard your heart with the peace of God. Don't get into bitterness. Don't get into anger. Don't get into judging another man's servant. Because we all God's servants. <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> so just be mindful of where we are in God's season, in God's time. Come on up, Dr. Ray. Let's give Dr. Ray a hand. Well, praise God, you know, when Howard was talking about this, you know, I mean, what kind of ex expectations do you all have? You, you expect to get a 30, 60, or 100 fold return? <laughs> How many have got that kind of expectation? Is that good? Well, see, I, uh, I gave some money to some people and and see now as a result of that, this see this last month I've gotten let's see about fifty percent return this last month on my investment. How many of you fifty how many of you are getting fifty percent return? See one of the problems is is expectations. Amen. If, if you don't expect to get anything, you won't get anything. But if you expect God to want, how many of you think God wants to bless you? That, see, that is an expectation, isn't it? So if you think God wants to bless you, uh, then are you willing to then, you know, to tithe into this ministry or or have an offering to someplace else? Amen. Or are you hanging on to your money? So what happens if you hang on to your money? <laughs> disappears, huh? See, the scripture says that if you hold on to it, you lose it. Right? But if you, but he says if you give it to people, right, then you'll have life eternal, right? Praise God, right? Well, thank you, Jesus, right? Well, you know, what I do is I pray about the message that God wants me to tell you. 
And because, and the reason I do that is because God knows that you have a need for something. See, one of the reasons why Howard gave this message that he just gave is because there was a need out here for you to all hear it. There was a need for you to, to realize about this seed time and harvest issue. How are we doing with this seed time and harvest issue? Are you a participant in seed time and harvest? Praise God, right? Well, the message that God gave me for you today is, well, it starts in uh, Psalms number 48. So let's look up Psalms 48. Now, one thing you need to know about these Psalms, right, is that God wants you to have a conversation with him. You all hear that? He wants you to have a conversation. Did you know that these psalms are really conversations that David was having with God? Amen. So when you read them, they're really, they're really a conversation. It's sort of like a conversation you're supposed to be having with God also, isn't it? Praise God, right? So in this Psalm 48, it is a conversation that David is having with, with God. So let's, see what, let's see what he has to say. So he starts off and he says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Praise God, right? So how many of you are dwelling in the mountain of his holiness? Huh? Or is that just, you know, part of our problems with all these things like Howard was saying, etc., is you, you, you take them you, and you use them as words. Did you hear that, right? But what you have to do is you have to take these things and you have to go from making them words into something, a reality in your life. Did you all hear that? So how many of you dwell in the holy mountain of his holiness? Huh? Praise God, right? And he goes on to say, Beautiful for situations, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So how many of you are dwelling in Mount Zion? Huh? Then he goes on to say, God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by. Now these are the kings of the earth. They passed by the mountain of the mountain of the Lord, right? They saw it and they were they marveled. Well, how big is the mountain of the Lord anyway? How big is it? 1,500 miles square. 1,500 miles square. <laughs> and 1,500 miles high. That's a big mountain, isn't it? You know that? And so what is, what is the mountain of the Lord uh, built of? What? Stones. So the mountain of the Lord is built of living stones. So one time the Lord gave me a, he told me, he showed me what it looked like. So you got this mountain, it's 1,500 miles high, right? But it looks sort of like an amoeba. You know, have you ever seen an amoeba under a microscope, you know? Amoeba under a microscope sort of, uh, sort of moves around, you know, and changes shape all the time. Have you ever seen that? But God's mountain is changing shape continuously. So why does God's mountain change shape continuously? As we grow. Because it's made out of what? Living stones. So it's made out of living. The whole mountain's living, okay? Not only does it change shape all the time, it changes color all the time, too. It continuously changes color. So you got this mountain that's changing shape, changing color, and it's never same, it's never same twice. It was, it just continuously changes. And then out of the mountain also comes a song. And the song that comes out of this mountain is never the same twice. It's always changing. And then on the next thing is that there's a perfume that comes out of this mountain. So are you the perfume? Yes. 
Why do you think you're the perfume? We will talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> Praise God, right? So then he goes on to say here, right? And the, Fear was upon them, and pain as a woman in travail. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God. God will establish it forever, Selah. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of the temple. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Remember, this is a conversation he's having with God. Then he says here, let, my, let Mount Zion rejoice. How can, how can a mountain rejoice? It's a living thing, isn't it? So the reason why I can rejoice is because it's a living entity, isn't it? And go around about her, tell the towers thereof, mark ye well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that ye may tell it to the generation falling. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. So praise God, right? So, so the issue about this psalm that God wants you to, un, to think about, okay, is this. God is, there's an instruction in this psalm, okay? And the instructions in this psalm is for you to walk around Zion. How many of you have ever walked around Zion? So the first problem is, well, when God told me this, that I was supposed to walk around Zion, he said, I said to him, well, Lord, I'm not sure if I understand how to walk around Zion. How many of you know how to walk around Zion? Praise God, right? And so then, so I started praying about it and started having a conversation with the Lord about this. And so, what he, first what he did to me is he, he showed me what the tabernacle of Moses looked like. <clears throat> so let me draw something up here for you, okay? So this is a tabernacle, right? And around the tabernacle are the tribes of Levi. The Levites were around the tabernacle. Okay? And so the number of Levites are, there are 22,000 men. Okay? And, but you have to really multiply that by approximately four. So that comes out to be approximately 80,000. So there are 80,000 people camped around the tabernacle. This is, now this is just the tribe of Levi, too. Yeah? Remember, there are a lot more people than just that around here. So there are 80,000 people around here. So now, so, the, so if we measure the distance between here and here, that's approximately 150 feet. OK? 150 feet there. And it's about 50 feet over here. You hear that? So we got 150 feet. That's a half the football length of a football field. Okay, about the width of a football field. And we got 80,000 people camped around it. That's a lot of people camped around it. It's not just people, but it's people with their tents. So they had tents also, right? So we got 80,000 people camped around there with their tents. So that's a lot of people, isn't it? So if we think about that, that means there's, there, it may be as much as a mile between this area here. So we look at this, if the people were way out here, right? Right? So now we got a problem there. 
The problem is, well, how do you, how do the people get from here to here, here? Because you had to go through like a gate here, okay? So the people came over here and they walked through here and then they walk around here, up here, and then they would give their sacrifices, and they would go up here and walk out and come back around, okay? That's how it worked. So now we got, so now we have to, there has to be an organization here then, right? A people, right? So this is really the gate, and this here really represents the wall of Jerusalem. Or the wall of, of the mountain of the Lord. So this is the mountain of the Lord here, right? And so to get it in the mountain of the Lord, you had to go through a gate. This is the gate here. And so there's all these people, 80,000 people around here. So you had to go through this gate. So as I was praying about this, you know, because this is what the Lord was telling me. It's interesting. This is what, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm asking him how to walk around the bulwarks, and this is what he's telling me. That's interesting, huh? And so then I said, could, of course, you know, I, what I wanted, to, what I was interested in was I was interested in walking around here, see, right? But he would never let me go there. He kept talking to me about this, and every time I tried to do that, he'd keep talking to me about this. And the reason he kept talking to me about this is because what we don't realize when you read that word bulwark, we think we're just supposed to go and look at the structures of, of the tabernacle, right? But really what the Lord's saying to, to us here is this. These, these are people here, right? All these people. And these people are what? The people are the bulwark. And that's why he would not let me get off the people. You sitting out there are the bulwark of God. So how many of you are part of this tabernacle? How many of you are living stones of this tabernacle? Did you hear that? You're the living stones that this tabernacle is built on. You are, you are the bulwark that God, in this scripture of Psalms 48. So when you look at a person, you really need to come to this realization that we are this tabernacle, and we're supposed to be observing each other. Now the next question about this, what part of this tabernacle are you? Because the way the tabernacle is built, the tabernacle is not built in, see, we build, the way we build buildings today, we build them, start at the foundation, then you build them up, right? Well, got, <clears throat> the tabernacle was not built that way. The tabernacle was built in parts. There, you'd have one person building one part, you have another group building another part, you have another building. So what part are you building? Anybody like to tell me what part they're building? So, Steve's building the throne. How many of you are building the throne? We only have one person building the throne? <laughs> What's that? Do you want to build the throne? So, how's the, so what, is this, what is the throne made out of? Gold living stones. So how many of you are gold living stones? Praise God, right? Gold living stones. See, and here's the throne here. The throne is way in here, right? Praise God. Here's the throne. It's also called the Ark of the Covenant, right? That's the same thing. That is the throne of God, right? And it's covered with gold. Okay, praise God, right? And so, so how do you become the how do you become the the Ark of the Covenant or the throne of God? How do you do that? By what? See, God's only given you one job to do. And your job is what? To believe, right? Did you hear that, right? Your job is to believe 
So all you have to do to become the Ark of the Covenant or the throne of God is to what? Believe that you are that, that you are this gold stone of the Ark of the Covenant. So now, I mean, and then he talked to me about another issue here. Here's the other, and this, but you have to realize all these issues, they're not separate issues. They're all, they're all go together. So the next issue is about this. There's in the, in the book of Esther, right? <clears throat> the king of the king of of the of this empire, right? He's gonna he's gonna have a big party. And the matter of fact, the party will last something like 140 days. That's, that's a that's a big party, isn't it? But one particular part was seven days long. And so after at the end of the seven days, then what he does. He asked them to go get Vasti, the, the queen. Okay? And so Vasti, the queen, refused to come to the party. And so, and actually the name of Vasti, would you like to know what the name of Vasti means? The name of Vasti means, where or why are you having a banquet? See, so Vasti was having her own banquet, wasn't she? She was having her own banquet, and she thought her banquet was more important than going to the banquet of the king. Did you all hear that? Now, why did the king want Vasti to... Wow. What? Wow. Yeah. Why did the king want Vasti to come to the banquet? Well, not just because she was a queen. He wanted her to come there because he wanted everybody to see her. Did you hear that? He wanted her, everybody to see her beauty. He wanted everybody to see how she was dressed. He wanted everybody to see all the jewels she had on. He wanted to see her, what kind of shoes she had on and her, how her hair was fixed up. He wanted everybody to come and see how how beautiful she was. So the issue about this thing is this, is that God has called you to be the queen. Can't get with that one, Dr. Ray. What's that? I can't, I can't get with that one. <laughs> I'm, not trying to be no, I'm not trying to be no queen, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't get with that one. <laughs> so God, listen, so God has called you to become a queen. And he's called you to become a queen. So he's invited you, did you hear this? He's invited you to come into his presence at the banquet. Has he not called, has he not invited you to come to the banquet? Yeah. It's the same as the bride. Yeah, it's the same as the bride, isn't it? <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? Did you hear that, right? You are the bride of you are the bride of Christ. Is that not correct? And Christ is the king, and he's gonna have a banquet, and you're invited to come to that banquet as the bride or the queen. Did you hear that? Now another but the other interesting issues about this is this is that he wants you to come to that banquet. How does he want you to be dressed? He wants you to be dressed like a queen. queen. Praise God, right? <laughs> Praise God, right? Now that's an interesting, right? Praise the Lord. Because you have to realize that, in fact, remember in the scripture, right? There, one of the parables in the scripture was about everybody being invited to this banquet, right? Have you been invited to the banquet? Huh? Yeah. Amen. Yes, you have, haven't you? But, see, then, but, there, but, but remember when they, when they went out there, there were people, remember they, they decided not to come to the banquet. They, they said they were too busy to come to the banquet, didn't they? Remember, and I'm using that word banquet, banquet. <laughs> the king had the banquet. Amen. And you're invited to come to that banquet. You're not coming, and you're not coming. So you can come to the banquet in several different ways. 
You probably didn't realize that. So you can come as a queen, or you can come as one of the queen's attendants. I'm attendant. <laughs> 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 so you can come as an attendant. What's that? Yeah. And see, the reason why this was written in the Bible about Vasti and about Esther was not just about a story. Did you all hear that? See, are, are you Esther in this Bible? Are you Esther in the Scripture? Or is this just a story for you to read? Yeah, you are Esther in this scripture. So now here's Esther. So, so now what happened is now, because Vasti refused to come to the banquet, right? Then they made this rule that she could never come before the king again. Did you all hear that? If you refuse to come to the banquet, you will never be allowed to come before the king again. Did you all hear that? So now here comes Esther, right? So the first thing Esther had to do, Esther had to get herself prepared to go before the king, right? So the first thing Esther had to do was what? Prepare. What's that? Prepare. Yeah, how'd she prepare? Fasting and praying. What's that? So the first thing they had to do is they had to they had to anoint her with no with myrrh with myrrh. So what is myrrh? that a question is why myrrh? What is myrrh? What's the name? What is the meaning of myrrh? Bitterness. The name the meaning of myrrh is bitterness. That means she had to be anointed with bitterness for six months. That's interesting, isn't it? How many of you have been ever been anointed with bitterness? Huh? <laughs> I bet I bet almost every single person here has been anointed with bitterness sometime, haven't we? Yeah. Right? See, then after six months of being anointed with bitterness, right, then she gets anointed with this very special oil, right? And that oil, the description of that oil is written in uh, Exodus chapter 30, okay, for you to read it, okay? And part of that is myrrh, but then there's other ones, cassia, etc., okay? And these things had beauty involved with them, but they also had perfume involved with it. So now... She's being anointed with beauty and perfume. Amen. Praise God, right? Amen. So how many of you have been anointed with beauty and perfume now? <laughs> <laughs> Careful, Howard, you're in trouble. <laughs> See, did you hear that? You've been anointed with what? Beauty and perfume. It has nothing to do with our, the way our flesh looks. Did you hear that, right? Praise God, right? You've been anointed with beauty and perfume, right? And she was, and she had that for six months, right? Praise God, right? And then she came before the king, right? Now, most of the people, that, most of the women that came before the king here that were went through this process, they uh, they uh, were allowed to dress and take whatever they wanted before the king. Hmm. Did you hear that? Are you taking what you want before the king? Amen. It's good, Dr. Ray. It's good. Or are you taking, see you now when Esther got ready to go before the queen, she didn't, she didn't take anything like that with her. She came with the dress that she had on. So what dress do you have on? Did you hear that? You've got some very special garments on, don't you? Right? You've got these very special garments on that, that allow you to come into the very presence of the king himself, right? Hallelujah, right? So God has invited you to come. And remember in that parable about the invitation, remember? 
Everybody, everybody came to the wedding there had to have a special garment on. Do you remember that? And there was one person that came there and didn't have the special garment on. What happened to that? What? They got thrown out into outer darkness, didn't they? Did you hear that, right? So, so now the question is, do you have that special garment on? Amen. Listen, your walk with, you see, God's only given you one job to do. Believe. <laughs> you got the idea. The one job God has given you to do is to believe, right? See, as God, see, one of the things you have to believe is, did God give you an invitation to come to this banquet, to the wedding banquet? Has he? Yes. Two. And are you prepared to come to it? Huh? Because you have to come to this, you have to, see this has to be your thinking process. You have to think of it. You, are you prepared to come to it? Have you gone through the, have you gone through the, the Mur Park? You probably all agree with that one. <laughs> but how many of you have gone through the oil part now? That you now are the beauty and have the perfume on you, right? <laughs> Praise God, right? Amen. How many of you have got the garment on? These are all parts of this thing about God's invitation for you to come to this to the wedding banquet. Praise God, right? <laughs> Hallelujah, right? <clears throat> now there's some other things we can talk about too, but this is mainly what God wanted me to talk to you about, is that you are now a queen. <laughs> See, and now how do you become a queen? By believing you're a queen. It has nothing to do with what you look like. See, there's that, you know, it's very interesting when you talk about being the bride of Christ. I can still remember I was playing basketball one day and I started talking to this guy and I said, well, you're the bride of Christ. And the guy said, I'm not, I'm not a bride. <laughs> so he couldn't deal with the fact that he was a bride because he didn't see himself in that way. See? It has nothing to do with you, you're male or female. How many of you are sons out there? Amen. You know? Sons has nothing to do with you being a male or a female. You being the bride of Christ has nothing to do with you being a male or a female. You being a queen has nothing to do with you being a male or a female. It has to do with what you believe and what God wants to do for you. Praise the Lord, right? Thank you, Jesus. See how we're doing the time. Ten minutes. So now we're going to go to we're going to go to another scripture here. Okay, and this is written in uh, John chapter five. Okay. And it starts in verse 17. John 5, 17. And it says here, it says, But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh here thereto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he, he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Okay, so the reason that the reason that Jesus got slain was why? Because he called himself the Son of God, made himself equal with God, and they considered that to be blasphemy, didn't they? So then he goes on to say, "Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself." Now the question about this scripture, you know, we've read this scripture many, many times, right? But our problem with this scripture is not that we don't know the scripture. Our problem is we've never completely figured out how to make it how to make it operate in our life, have we? So we've always had this question: How do we do this? How do we do it that we, that we are only going to do the things the Father shows us to do? That's a problem for us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Praise God, right? 
So one of the first things it says here, let's read that scripture again. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Now the first question is, he's saying the Son can do nothing of himself. So the question is, are you the Son? Huh? Are you the Son? <laughs> so why are you the Son? So you're the Son because you are one with Jesus. Is it, are, how many of people out here are one with Jesus? Well, if you're one with Jesus, you must be also the Son, right? Praise God, right? So now the Scripture... So the scripture wasn't written about only about Jesus. The scripture was also written about you. So we have to get you in this scripture. Hear that? Praise God, right? Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son, that's you, can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now hidden in this scripture is this thing that we talked about earlier. So what's hidden in this scripture? It's you having a conversation with the Father. Huh? Yeah. If you don't have a, if you don't have a conversation with the Father, right? How can you possibly hear the things you're supposed to do and be shown the things you're supposed to be doing? So one of the issues you, you, we need to start having here is having a conversation with the Father, okay? Praise God, right? Then he goes on to say in verse 20, For the Father loves the Son. Does the Father love you? Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you love the Father? Yes. Now one of the issues about that is this. <clears throat> there are Christians out there who love being a Christian. But they're not in love with Jesus. Are you in love with Jesus? Yes. Or are you just in love with being a Christian? Jesus. See, you have to get this idea that you need to be in love with Jesus. What does it mean to be in love with Jesus? <laughs> well, I think the easiest... Well, I think the easiest way for us to understand this about what it means to be in love with Jesus is sort of like when you met your spouse, right? When you met your spouse, you wanted to be with your spouse all the time, right? You, you were interested in what she was doing, where she was, right? You wanted to go out with her, you wanted to eat dinner with her, right? You wanted to go out and do things with her. That you wanted to have conversations with her, you wanted to have talks with her. Some of you may have even had talks that last for four or five hours, huh? That was you, right, Ken? <laughs> but see, this is what it means to be in love with Jesus. It means you want to be where he is, do what he's doing, talk with him all the time. How many hours a day do you talk with him? Huh? You should be, yeah, you should be talking with him seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? That's how much you're supposed to be talking to him. And if you start talking to him like that, he, so let's read this scripture again, right? Where he says, right? Verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him what? Greater works. All things. Did you all hear that? Is there anything that the Father won't show you? Not anything, is there? See, so the problem is not that the Father doesn't want to show you what? All things. What's the problem then? The problem is us. Not doing what? Not having a conversation with Him. 
That's what the problem is, right? Praise God, right? For the Father showeth the Son, loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Did you hear that? You are the Son. He's committed all judgment unto you. Did you all hear that? So listen, how does, how does Jesus judge? He judges righteously and out of justice, right? Justice and righteousness. So one of the problems you, we got with this judgment issue is not that itself, it's it's yourself. How do you judge yourself? Huh? How do you judge yourself? Amen. Are you are you perfect? No. Then you judge yourself incorrectly. Oh. <laughs> How many of you are just like Jesus? How many of you are one with Jesus? How many of you are, have all of the divine natures of Jesus? Listen, you cannot judge correctly till you see yourself correctly. Once Amen. you start to see yourself correctly, then you can judge other people the way they're supposed to be judged. Remember, the person sitting next to you is 100% like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was funny. Did you hear that? The person sat next to you is 100% like Jesus. Amen. So therefore, God has given you the right to judge the person sitting next to you. But if you judge it, listen, judgments are out of, out of righteousness, but lots of Christians are judging out of condemnation. Yeah. Amen. Did you hear that? And the reason why they're judging out of condemnation is why? The way you see yourself. Amen. See, see if, you get your, if you get your judgment of yourself correctly, then you'll judge the person sitting next to you correctly. Hallelujah, right? So are you perfect? Yes. <laughs> I got it. Amen. Are you pure? Yes. Are you holy? Yes. Are you just like Jesus? Yes. Amen, right? So this is what God, this is God's plan for us. God's plan was not for us to be this, the uh, person at the bottom of the heap. heap. So God's plan was for us to be one with him. And he's at the top of the heap. And so because he's at the top of the heap, you're going to be at the top of the heap with him. Hallelujah, right? Well, praise God, right? So this is the message God gave me. Now the reason why God gave this message to me for you is because there was a need out here for you to hear this. Did you all hear that? There was a need for you to hear that you are the queen. Praise God, right? You're the queen that's been invited to come to the banquet, to the wedding feast of God, to, for, of Jesus, as the queen. He did not invite you to come as the attendant. But did you know there did you know that there are attendants in the scripture? Unfortunately, see there's there are attendants when when uh, Esther became queen, she had attendants with her that that did not become queens. In the book of Song of Solomon, there are attendants to the queen. Do you want to be an attendant or do you want to be the queen? <laughs> Amen. Praise God, right? So the way you become the queen rather than the attendant is how? Believe. By believing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, right? Okay. Lord, we just thank you, Jesus. We thank you for this word that you're giving to us, Lord. This is a word that you gave us for these last days, Lord, that we would grab a hold of our relationship with you in a new way, Jesus. That we truly are the Queen, Jesus. 
that we are like Esther in the scripture, and that you've invited us, Lord, to enter into, this, into your very presence at this banquet, Lord, dressed in the royal garments. Hallelujah, Jesus. Now, Lord, talk to us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us to have a conversation with you, Jesus, that we would know exactly what to do and how to do it, Lord. Now, Lord, be with us, Lord, as we're going forth here, Lord. As, as we go forth now, Lord, we're going to go forth as the queen, dressed in your royal garments. In the name of Jesus now, amen. Amen. amen.